Robert Poltz is a PhD and Associate Professor of Digital Aesthetics. He has published on digital and media aesthetics from the 19th century panorama to the interface in its various forms. So, for example, on electronic literature, net art, software art, creative software, urban interfaces and digital culture. He took part in establishing a digital aesthetics research center in 2002. And in 2004, he co-organized the Read Me Festival on software art. And he was in charge of the research project, The Aesthetics of Interface Culture, from 2004 to 2007. Later, he was research manager in the Center for Digital Urban Living from 2008 to 2012. And currently, he is leader of the research program, Humans Information Technology, and part of the Interdisciplinary Research Center, Participatory Information Technology. In relation to these research fields and groups, he has been active in establishing interface criticism as a research perspective, which discusses the role and the development of the interface for art, aesthetics, culture, and IT. So Søren's Sur interests cover digital aesthetics broadly, including electronic literature, net art, software art, urban art, and activism, and he has participated in founding several of these fields since the mid-1990s. Simultaneously, he is interested in establishing digital aesthetics as a perspective in other IT research fields such as design, HCI, I don't even know what that is, HCI. Human computer interaction. <laughs> exactly. Informatics and internet research. So Soren's paper is entitled Ink After Print Literary Interface Criticism. Right. Thanks. Uh, so do we get the presentation? Yeah. Okay, uh, and thanks a lot, uh, Janneke and uh, Gary, for inviting me. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, Gary was just visiting Aarhus University last week, so I know all about your uh, fantastic work. So I'm really happy to be here uh, uh, at the Disruptive Media Center. Um, what I've been, what I'll try to do uh, within my limited time is to sort of sketch out some work I'm doing currently with some colleagues at Aarhus University. Uh, both theoretically and more practically and artistic. Uh, whether it's research creation, we can perhaps get back to. Um, uh, and uh, the colleagues I should mention is uh, Christian Ulrik Andersen and uh, Jonas Fritz. Um, and some of that, there's, there's already some material on the, the wiki as well. Uh, I actually have a manifesto as well, so. Uh, and I'm going to be really quick, uh, just to sort of introduce uh, sort of the ongoing foundation for my work, which has been interface criticism. Uh, it's sort of a field I've been working within for almost 10 years. Uh, 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 sort of initially started also by, inspired by people like Le Manovich, Stephen Johnson. Uh, and uh, been going on with it, uh, and interesting, there seems to be more people who take up that term nowadays, uh, like uh, Johanna Drucker, we're going to hear uh, later, uh, Laurie Emerson, uh, Alex Galloway, and uh, that's interesting because for a long while people tended to sort of say that, well, why talk about interfaces, aren't they going away? I believe they're not, and uh, that's part of what I'm going to to say with, with these uh, six quick points. Uh, so in general, it's about how, how, um, how our current culture, the arts, how, how, how it, it interferes with interfaces and how the interface becomes a material, technological, and cultural basis for, 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 uh, for arts and aesthetics. Uh, so, so what does this mean? How can we work with this? Uh, this, this sort of in interference of technological forms and uh, more sort of traditional humanistic aesthetic uh, forms. Uh, so the most sort of generic functioning of the interface is this sort of connecting of writing or code, if you want, and functionality, signs and signals, some call it, uh, uh, or you could also say functionality and aesthetics. Um, uh, which takes place in interfaces and, and in software in general. Uh, so that's sort of the basic point, that it, 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 that it mixes these two domains, technology and what we usually work with in the, the humanities. And secondly, like, like uh, language, like we used to, to think of language uh, and media in general, uh, our technological culture also wants interface to be transparent, 
invisible and go away. Uh, almost every new technology markets itself as interface-less and beyond the interface. And we've seen that uh, all the time through digital culture, you know, we're talking about intuitive interfaces, virtual reality. 20 years ago, now we talk about smart cities and big data, and it seems to have the same impetus that we get rid of the interface. Um, uh, but but it, it, it sort of keeps coming back uh, with a vengeance, and it's still uh, a defining, and we also think it's a defining feature of the computer as a machine, uh, how the computer works, that it's layered uh, with interfaces and, uh, and it has this uh, coupling of signs and signals. Uh, and it, it's, and, and, and it's, it has this layering of interfaces all the way from user interfaces uh, down to uh, the, the very sort of uh, nitty gritty of the computer, down to the levels of codes and, in, and even into sort of uh, you know, plugs and 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 uh, and um, and, uh, um, and the way you know we discuss how a USB port is is working, stuff like that. Uh, and of course, it's also how it interferes with culture in a sort of larger term. Um, and uh, but but why do we want this to go away? Perhaps because that. Interfaces are all, always uh, ideological constructs, and, and we, we, they tend to hide this construction away and, and appear purely functional. Uh, new technologies are supposed to make us do stuff more easy, uh, not create new formal languages, but of course they always do exactly that. So. Uh, so and 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 uh, and and they build on uh, traditions also. Interf that's a long story, but to, sort of to take the short version, you could you could sort of take three genres, three traditions. The sort of the military surveillance tradition, the pragmatic functionality, user friendliness tradition, the tool tradition, and then sort of the aesthetic tradition ar ar around ex expression, which of course includes uh, aesthetic experiences, um, and it always has these three traditions in it, uh, um, uh, and, and for instance, we see, that we see this with uh, social media that uh, you know, we thought they were all about expressing ourselves and then we really realized that they are an in, in, in intelligence uh, technology, or they seem to be. Um, and the fifth is that the interface is not just a surface, but it's embedded, it's layered, it's enacting exchanges and translations. And uh, just as I just said about the computer that it's, it's a layered architecture of interfaces, interfaces are also in increasingly, but it's not a new thing, embedded in, in everything in, 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 uh, in, the, in the urban, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in various uh, gadgets, etc. And, and we see a lot of development around this currently. And uh, the final sort of the most sort of aesthetic uh, way of, of, of saying this is that the interface constitutes the, the sensible uh, sort of in a rangere uh, understanding. Uh, and, and, and furthermore, it, of course, it, it constitutes the way we can interact with computers and also what remains hidden. Um, uh, so what's screened off behind the screen. Yeah, so that was sort of the quick introduction to interface criticisms and, and then I'd like to move on to sort of the literary uh, writing interfaces uh, to ask them what, what, what does it, what does it um, how does it affect uh, literature, uh, printing, publishing? Uh, well, we, for instance, if we take the ebook, which is uh, pretty pre uh, prevalent uh, right now, uh, Amazon says something like uh, in their sort of about page that our top design, I'm quoting, our top design objective is to make Kindle disappear, just like a physical book. When did that ever disappear? <laughs> so you can get lost in your reading, not the technology. So that's a typical example of this uh, second point uh, I mentioned before about the tendency to displace and repress the mediation of the interface. You could say, what are they trying to hide? Uh, or how or, or how is uh, the the repression of the computer and the interface in this kind of thinking used to distribute the sensible to ask with uh, Rangier and control the reading towards uh, and 
What they do to sort of be very quick, and I have to be quick, is that they sort of impose a, a, a business model which uh, uh, I've specified as controlled consumption, and it's, it's building on work from uh, Ted Stripers. Um, um, and it's evident that, that e-books and the Kindle not only build on tradition of books, but also on software production. So stuff like licensing, of course, is, is, is pretty much part of, of how e-books work. Uh, copyright, trademarks, all this kind of stuff gets built into the licensing scheme. But what also happens is that they build, into, they build it into a specific infrastructure, like you have this cybernetic infrastructure around products and distribution, for instance, the Kindle, uh, but all, it could also be the iPad or the, you know, Android, uh, whatever, tablets, uh, or something like, uh, like um, uh, game consoles would be another example of this. And what it does is that it monitors consumption. Uh, so there's the surveillance part. Uh, and, and, and it's also there's, also, there's also this kind of business model where consumption becomes a, a form of production that we kind of know from Web2 uh, platforms that they monitor your consumption to turn it into production. And, uh, and then there's a limited functionality uh, built into the gadget uh, and some kind of obsolescence uh, programmed into the product. I guess we know all about that, uh, tr trying to change the battery of, the, of our iPhones, for instance. Uh, and then it, it reorganizes everyday practices. Uh, Ted Stravers actually builds on, on, on Lefebvre, so that's also where the everyday practices come in. And, and, and a good example of that it would be how, how uh, libraries uh, and, and you know, how our literary culture is changing uh, because uh, you can't share, you can't uh, lend out uh, an e-book, you can't sell it uh, secondhand. Uh, so there's a lot of... Um, and, 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 and they are also re reorganizing reading uh, by the fact that they actually monitor your reading. You know, that was supposed to be a very gross thing to do uh, that, you know, if I stand behind you when you're reading and looking into how you, what you're reading, it's supposed to be very, not very nice, but that's exactly what they're, they're doing. And of course it looks like this, we all know that, uh, this structure of, of, of the shop built into the, to the platform and, uh, and with the monitoring and recommendation scheme and all that stuff. So that's sort of how you know, you could say how interfaces get built into literary culture in a sort of quite, not quite visible way. Uh, and, and then uh, I want to point uh, quickly to, well, most quickly with the first one to sort of, uh, you know, how do we work with that? Uh, one, one, one quick example will be a, a sort of a, a project we well, I wouldn't say that we did it. We collaborated a bit with the the the, the artist called the artist group called uh, Uber Morgan, uh, Hans Bernhard and Lisflix, um, Austrian Swiss. Yeah, they live in Austria, I believe. Uh, and uh, they did this project uh, called the project formerly known as Kindle Forkbomb, where they took. Um, uh, comment from uh, videos, from YouTube videos, uh, you know, if you, and, and they, they were sort of inspired by all the negative comments on the Re Re Rebecca Black Friday YouTube video, I don't know, well, it's a long story, I'm not going to get into it, but it, it was like some American teenager that made a, an appearance on YouTube, uh, trying to sort of act as a pop star, and he got a lot of hate commentaries. Com commentaries. And they, they sort of lifted that uh, and then uh, made it into books, uh, sort of dramas, uh, invented uh, authors uh, and, and, and uh, characters, uh, sort of assigned all the, the comments to different characters. So it appeared as a drama uh, and then put it into uh, Kindle, as uh, the Kindle bookshop as, as e-books you could actually buy. Uh, and, and, and they have to sort of develop this whole machinery. Well, it's part of their artwork that they do these kind of diagrams. Uh, but you can see it looks like a printing press. So it's, you could say it's sort of the new printing press of Amazon that you see diagrammed here. You know, you, you have, you know, 
they you know, and 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 they were actually they had to sort of um, um, you know they had to sort of work with this whole mechanism in order to make their work uh, uh, appear in the, the and in including sort of uh, hiding from Amazon. I guess Amazon actually managed to 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 find most of their books and delete them again. But the the, the idea was to sort of flood Amazon from within. Uh, with books generated from this, this endless archive of, of YouTube comments. Uh, so you see how they sort of managed to, 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 to diagram the whole Amazon machinery. Um, so that's, and, and this, you know, we actually write about that in this article. Uh, I believe it's on the, the, the wiki. Um, and another project that's more sort of, we, we built uh, ourselves. It's this project called Ink After Print, and if you add a .dk, you can find more material on it. Uh, it's a sort of a platform and intervention, whether it's a research cr creation we can perhaps discuss. So it's a platform I've developed with co colleagues to make research and to try out and activate concepts such as interface criticism, post-digital literature, and effective interaction. Uh, and it comes out of the collaboration with a library in Denmark in uh, Roskilde, close to Copenhagen, on how to present digital literature in a library setting. Uh, and we started out from a reflection on media changes within literature uh, and uh, how it affected the library as institution. And this reflection made us come up with the idea of using books. Uh, and, and you can see the books here, and you can't open them. Uh, so you, you can't you, can, you can't read read them in a, in a traditional way, but they become interaction devices for reading a textual machine, sort of in an ergodic uh, way where you make your own well you you, you collaborative produce your own text with the machine, uh, um, and and the reader uh, experiences becoming part of this text production machine. So that was the incentive uh, to sort of let readers uh, experience this, being a reader writer that is not quite the author, but is rendered more active and also limited by the machine, of course. So first version of it was built in 2012. Uh, it's been installed at several libraries uh, in Denmark uh, and conferences and festivals, and including the, uh, the Danish uh, rock festival called Roskilde Festival, which is a major uh, festival in Denmark uh, with, I guess, uh, around 100,000 people. Uh, and, and that festival, uh, it's a bit dark, but maybe you can see it installed there. I'll show a video later. Uh, more than 1,000 poems were produced, uh, and several thousand were exposed to digital literature for the first time. Now, uh, it's, it's still touring uh, libraries in Denmark, and we've made a third version where the text is translated into English. Uh, and we intend to use this for further development. So the point is that readers, they uh, individually, but also collaboratively, there are three books, uh, can produce poems by interacting. Uh, and the, the three books, they're embedded with a, with a custom-made sensor. So you sort of use it like a Wii controller. Uh, and then the books let people control a floating sentence in an ocean of words towards a sheet of paper to produce a poem all visualized on, on this display in the middle. And the sentences are written by a Danish author called Peter Clement Wodman. They were retrieved from a database of, of, of about 100 sentences for each book that can be manipulated in three variants. So you get like a 1,000 sentences all in all. And then, then people produce poems that when they reach 350 characters, they are finished, printed out, uh, and then people get them on a library receipt, and they are uploaded also to, to a blog. Um, so it's it's uh, it's sort of a an experiment with 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 three sort of performative levels: the sort of ergodic textual level, where the reader co-produces the text uh, through her reading, uh, and then there's sort of a more you could say a more embodied level where readers play the textual machine through an effective interface built around the transfer of text and literature from the meeting medium of books to the computer interface to paper and to print and onto an online website. So there's a, 
a number of transitions that actually turned out to be important. And then on the social level, where readers watch others perform uh, the text, uh, others perform the textual machine and the resulting text by e.g. By, by reading them, them aloud from the printout. So there are sort of several performative layers. And uh, just to, to uh, give you an idea, uh, I just want to show this two minute video. Um, this is a close up of the screen. Yeah, with the Danish text. So you get assigned sentences and then you put them onto the. And there's some stuff from Roskilde Festival. Men der gik lige noget tid fra det der fra spillet til at finde ud af, hvor det er en tekst der kommer ind og det hænger sammen. Der er pludselig en mening i det, så skal man så lige. Ja, ja, ja. Det er sjovt, fordi det så er sådan forskellige sætninger sat sammen og så bliver sådan en lille poesi, roman, you know. Så man skal lige finde ud af. Kan jeg, hvordan kan jeg overhovedet påvirke det her, eller er det bare oh, sådan tilfældigt at mm. lige sådan lære, hvordan holder man ved bogen? Jeg oplevede, at jeg kunne sjappe med øh, nogle ord, ja. men helt til sidst. Det giver ikke mening eller hvad? Nej, Hvordan føles det at producere tekst på den måde? <laughs> det er en million dollars spørgsmål. Øhm. Nysgerrig. Og så til sidst så bliver det bare, at man bliver så grebet, og man har lyst til at faktisk blive, altså man har lyst til at gå i gang igen og lave et, et, et dig mere. Nej, 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 jeg skriver dagen i gang, stille vi bag øjnene. Sætninger af et hav, sådan når du siger mit navn, svarer vi Tilbage i fortiden, og... i ensomheden, strakte jeg hver sætning ud, så den kunne glide hen over Ikke bunden. Ikke er kommet derud. De sidste par nætter sidder stadigvæk i de øverste lag af min hud. Jeg har skrevet jeg kort til dig. Og se dig vågne. Idealet visker den stille vind, er ikke nødvendigvis de klippede træer, den stram komponerede bog. Okay. Jeg vil nok karakterisere det som nonsens. Ja, det er klart. Det, det er tekst. Ja. Det er interaktiv tekst. Ja. 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 Vil I karakterisere det som litteratur? Ja. Det ved jeg ikke. Det synes jeg er svært at svare på. Jeg ved ikke, hvis det er litteratur. Okay. Det vil jeg det. Ja. Det er det ikke, jeg har tænkt mig at gå hjem og hænge op. Um, yeah, what we found was interesting is, uh, well, of course, there was an edited video with some of the observation from the festival and some of our interviews. And, and we found it noteworthy that users, how users perform this sort of reading, writing, how this performance is social, collaborative, and draws others from the audience into the interaction with the platform. And we also found it interesting that people were quite sophisticated in their understanding of the interface. They kind of move from you know just playing and having fun to starting it actually working sort of literary with reading and writing it onto onto understanding how the platform works and being interested in the interface and how it worked and uh, and um, yeah so there's you know you could sort of talk about concepts such as Kenneth Goldsmith he talks about on creative writing or or uh, Manuel Portela talks about material self-reflexive meter readers, how they develop. And uh, this platform we now uh, are, are planning to, to uh, develop uh, further from, from engaging with digital literature in, in a library setting. We also believe that uh, we want to you know, take on some of these post-digital literary experiments with the platform. Um, uh, and. Um, one one thing we want to we want to develop further is to have sort of a more you know develop the critical interface perhaps have a more sort of machinic interface where we apply more uh, algorithmic text production um, uh, uh, yeah uh, algorithms uh, like this one is uh, Ulipu uh, in 
in noun plus seven, where you take all the nouns and then you uh, count seven nouns down in a dictionary and, and then you change them. Uh, and there are, of course, several. Uh, so to, to, to sort of work more with, uh, with um, uh, generative literature in that sense. Um, um, and um, and uh, another uh, thing we want to work with is sort of the performative dimension, uh, the performative archiving dimensions. Um, because uh, where we also sort of want to take it want to take it beyond the literary and, and perhaps work with uh, open data, uh, spatial data uh, 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 into sort of areas, sort of smart cities, uh, uh, where we, 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 want to ex we want to experiment with taking some of the, this data, some of the text, and, and, and perhaps having people uh, interact with that uh, uh, and, and, and yeah, use the platform for for an inter, uh, uh, sort of a, 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 an alternative interface to archives. But it could also be sort of, yeah, other kinds of textual archives, of course. Um, so that would be a way also to take it outside of, you know, the, the, the frames of literature uh, and literary institutions, uh, being a lit and making it a literary interface for reading the text of the world, you could say, uh, or generating literacy in, into something like like uh, like open data and all this stuff that floats around. Okay, um, so that was, I believe, uh, my time is up. Uh, but uh, two brief examples. Well, trying to to quickly introduce interface criticism and 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 and, and talk about how we work with it, both sort of analytically uh, and uh, and. Uh, and uh, practically, um, and and of course, sort of the general issue is how culture is packaged in IT uh, formats, and how it how we might build alternatives to that. Thank you. Thank you, Saren. So we've got about twenty minutes for discussion now. I think we're going to bring up. Aaron now on the screen. Did you get to see it in the end, Aaron, or was it all? Yeah, I saw good. some parts. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so we'll get you. Oh, well, you're up already. So, does anybody have questions, remarks, responses to these two amazing presentations that we just saw? Don't be shy. I have a quick one for Soren. You brought up the facts, uh, the, the mo monitoring of reading activity. So, it's, it's a question which I asked. Mm. So how do you see the difference, if there is one, from monitoring a reading activity of a book or monitoring we website, views on the website, that, as, you, as you surely know, they are pretty deep mm. as a way of monitoring, you know, every click, basically, yeah, on the yeah. website. So do you see any difference in this sense? Well, well technically, it's pretty much the same thing, right? But, but, but culturally... We are, you know, we are bringing sort of this, you know, website monitoring or you know the into into a literary culture where where we, you know, we're quite used to thinking of notions of privacy and uh, freedom of speech, and you know, there are a lot of really heavy traditions uh, related to the book. Uh, so I think it's a very serious issue, something that we should discuss a lot more. Actually, you know, yeah. And also, you know, it's 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 really, um, uh, uh, you know, it's it's very sensitive data. You get out, you know, think of all the books you read and you know the underlinings and when and where and how long you read and all this kind of stuff. That's a that's very private data, I would say. And and you know, who who dares read what on their Kindle? <laughs> Other questions, and we need to use the microphone. Yes. <laughs> no, sorry, that was me. <laughs> Here you go. Hello. Uh, hi. Yep, yep, yep. One, one here. Hello. Um, question for uh, Aaron. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed your talk, um, Aaron. But I think, um, in terms of sort of measuring and, and quantification, as as academics, we we kind of um, we kind of get judged by how many outputs we have. It's writing, 
or um, whether it's uh, uh, exhibitions or anything like that, speeches we give, whether it's over Skype or, or otherwise. And some of us academics benefit quite a lot from that. Um, and as an academic who probably has benefited quite a lot from, from um, having loads of measurable outputs, why are you dead against uh, quantification? <laughs> Uh, great question. Um, I think that there are, are different things at stake in what I'm trying to do. Um, uh, for me, the, 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 what, what prompted the writing of this paper um, was that I, I found myself suddenly asked about methodology quite frequently in two different directions. So there was sort of a flurry of publications. Um, asking me to write about uh, research creation and methodology. And at the same time, I was directing a PhD program, um, an interdisciplinary PhD program at Concordia, where um, the students all devised their own PhD, and they were asking for methods. And so I started wondering what this, what this tendency was uh, that I was seeing emerge. So we have we have a, a, a new period in the university where there's clearly something happening in relation to developing knowledge in areas that are not generally understood as being part of knowledge formation, so in, in arenas that are not writing um, heavy. And at the same time, there being a, a desire to capture those write, not writing heavy or sort of pre-linguistic forms of, of engagement within the methodological uh, enterprise, which which it strikes me always has to come from the social sciences, because be, at least in the Canadian context, the parameters for knowledge tend to come from there, citation practices, etc. So, so I guess um, you know, in in order to really push what I'm trying to do, I wanted to to ask the question of method at its heart, to ask what it is that we want to attend to when we're thinking methodologically, and really ask whether forms of knowledge that are that are generative can even fall within, within those parameters. For the question of quantification itself, I mean, I think that's a really tricky question. It's much worse for you in the UK than it is for us in Canada. Um, we haven't, uh, you know, what we, the systems of value or evaluation in, in the university have not come to us in the same way yet. So what you have and what Australia has so far, we're not we're not as caught up with those kinds of numbers as you are, fortunately. But um, but the the thinking as I'm as I'm pausing it is is even wants to go a step further than that to ask whether those modes of quantification can produce knowledge. I mean, I'm very, very concerned with where I think the university is going in terms of of the ways in which we package um, thinking. And so, yes, I have to quantify as much as possible in order to keep my job because the work that I do doesn't fall squarely uh, within the requirements of disciplinary culture. So I'm constantly in this kind of double bind where I'm where I'm um, appealing to the uh, to the overachiever in me, while at the same time exploring modes of engagement which fall in other kinds of categories, I guess. Okay, last question. Yeah, um, thanks for that, Aaron. That was uh, that was an uh, interesting answer. Um, I also say about capitalism, about um, the fact that capitalism um, captures, and I quote, captures processes of individualization, mm -hmm. which it perhaps does, uh, I'm not sure. But um, and and as you say, you're sort of trying to escape from from the process, the the kind of um, the kind of clause of capitalism. Um, mm -hmm. Would would you take a pay cut to to uh, kind of um, you know reduce the effects of capitalism capitalism's evil machinery on you? Would you be prepared for that? Because then you wouldn't be able to perhaps consume as much. Uh, yes. Um, we're working on an alternative, free, unaccredited university, so we're definitely following that path. We, at, at Concordia, or in Montreal, I've been running an environment called the Sense Lab for uh, 11 years that has been functioning on alter economies. So the, the thinking of capitalism comes from a long practice of 
working at the interstices of capitalism, um, thinking about modes of learning, uh, modes of teaching, modes of engagement, which use the infrastructures of the university, but don't necessarily belong to the systems of accreditation and quantification that are key to the university. So it's not against the university, but trying to think about ways of engaging learning and making and thinking that don't immediately uh, fall into structures of debt. Um, so, I mean, I'm not alone in this. This is a, a long and engaged project with people from all over the world. A lot of people actually from Aarhus, we have a strong group as well, um, which is looking to be as inventive as it can um, in the sense of operating from the edges of capitalist culture because we can't get out of it, we don't think, at least um, and not in any kind of black and white way. So, so yes, I would be. But, but again, I want to say that I think from from my travels and from um, my explorations that Montreal is a very particular place in that regard. That you know, you we're, we're living in a in a province in Canada that where only two percent of the population make over one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year. So we're living in a in an, in a in a place that doesn't operate um, within the parameters that are necessarily those of the territory that surrounds it. Um, and one of the things that is pr profoundly different, I think, is that where the majority of people make thirty thousand dollars a year, there isn't a strong sense of poverty. So part of what we've been thinking about is how poverty or the, the sense of precarity that's identified as poverty um, is felt within certain cultures more so than in others and for what reasons. And I think that you'd have to pursue that down the line to get to the question of what you'd be giving up if you gave up forms of capital that are um, available to us, uh, those of us who are middle class. Just on, yeah. on this, I, I, I think uh, uh, obviously it's it's important. These questions are important. Uh, if you know, if if you look at you know how computing has become cultural and how you have these cultural interfaces or cultural platforms, it's it's you know you could say on on one hand it's a it's a it's a it's an opportunity. Uh, you know, most of our students, I guess the students here, also get jobs within this kind of of economy. Uh, um, uh, uh, and at the same time, it, it is about you know cap capitalization moving further. That 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 uh, our indiv individual expression, even our modes of reading, are are becoming sort of capitalized uh, by these systems. Um, so that's the situation we're in. I, I don't believe there's any escape, really. Uh, we have to sort of know it and take, take advantage of it. And I tend to sort of subscribe pretty much also to sort of the idea of disruptive innovation, you know, doing something within perhaps building alternatives but, or, or building knowledge about how the system works. Um, but I. I, I, you know, I would, I wouldn't believe there's any real escape. Really, you know, we can only work within the structure, really. But it's, it's this coupling of signs and signals we are, we are in, and uh, at least it means we're in the game. It's not only signals. <laughs> Uh, thanks for, for two great talks. We really enjoyed them. Um, uh, I'm also on a bit of a kick at the moment where uh, when just because people kind of talk next to each other doesn't mean that we have to somehow bridge uh, the gaps between them and you know get rid of the singularity of each kind of project and whatever. But anyway, I'm going to try to do something like that despite all of that, which is pick up on what Erin was talking about, about philosophy being uh, a making and one way of interpreting what, what Soren was talking about would be kind of trying to enact some of that, but I, I suppose what I'm conscious of is, and it kind of relates also to the Kenneth Goldsmith book about the uncreative writing, is that tends to happen, or you get tend to pushed into sort of artistic spheres. You know, the, I mean, there was a rock festival you were at, but you know, you kind of 
you're displaying those in artistic forms, and I'm just wondering how possible it is to do that in, you know, in philosophy. It seems very hard to do that in philosophy. Mm -hmm. Uh, you do then get pushed back into quite conventional forms of, you know, you started by showing the book and, you know, the author and all those kind of things, uh, which also relates to what Erin was talking about in the cut and how do we make those, how, do, how are we deciding which cuts to make where in terms of enacting processes. Um, so some of those things we're kind of going with and then others we're kind of having to say, and it goes back to the question, how do we cope with institutions? And we have to make books look like certain things, uh, you know, those kind of objects. And when soon as you don't do that, then you get pushed into art. And how much is art is just a kind of a safety valve or a, sp a safe place to ask those questions. Mm -hmm. How can we then bring those questions back into something like philosophy or other parts of the institution? Sh shall I start? I think that would be appreciated, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, getting from, I'm getting from the expressions, yes. <laughs> All right. Um, it's a great question. I mean, it's really, um, I, think, I think it's, it's uh, I think any of these concepts in the way that I understand them can't be attended to in general. I think you, you, you really have to look at each instance as it evolves. So, as Soren was talking about the, the work on the interface, we, we also do a lot of work. Uh, we have a journal called Inflections, and for the last seven or eight years, we've been working to undo this idea that the interface is something that is um, backgroundable and making the interface the, the proposition of another kind of reading that happens uh, on the web. So take, trying to challenge the idea that that the web is only there for a continuation of, a, of the same kind of reading habits that happen in the non-web uh, print culture. Um, but of course, as you can imagine, this comes with all kinds of challenges because if our reading on the web involves, for example, tabbing instead of reading, then how comfortable are we with uh, people not actually reading what we do, but tabbing it, for example, and what kinds of modes of attention are produced? So for the, the work that I do and the work that we do at the Sense Lab, we try to address each of those kinds of questions one-on-one -on -one to ask, does this question need to be philosophically addressed or does it need to be artistically activated? And usually we're moving between the two. I think where I have a difference from what you're saying, though, is that it seems to me that, at least in the world that I live in, being an artist is a really hard thing. I mean, the artists that I know are um, very precarious economically and um, are taking the kinds of risks that people who are of institutions often don't take. So I would see it a little bit the other way around, that, that part of what I'd like to see within the academic world and the world of philosophy as well is the risk taking that that I see around me in the context of, of artistic practice. I think you do get punished for it. There's no question that you get punished for it and that the most uh, transversal philosophers will never get hired in philosophy departments. They, their work will never be acknowledged as philosophy with a capital P because it doesn't attend to the historicizing of the tradition, but rather invents with it. And, and so I think that's a risk worth taking. Um, but again, it's it's hard for me to speak in in general across across the two because I also think there's a third there's a third question which is that 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 of a kind of activist practice that doesn't produce any kind of object so that doesn't look like art, um, but that operates with the the interstices of both art and philosophy in order to activate um, the social in ways that that may also open it up. And I think that, that in that context, you, you, become, you, you begin to blur um, a number of boundaries that, that then need to be attended to one at a time in, in, in the context of what the event is. Uh, yeah, uh, to answer your question, yeah, it is hard. <laughs> and, and, and one of the, you know, one of the things, you know, I, I don't, I don't, well, even though I've tried to, to, you know, I've tried to put this platform into my university CV, you know, into this system that registers my research, well, I said I made this platform software, whatever you call it, 
I don't think it counts really. You know, it, it, it only counts when it becomes you know written about in articles, and uh, and uh, but but you do get a lot of knowledge. Uh, you you know, you, you, you find out a lot of things when you do things in practice. And and for instance, w w if you work with people in social situations, you can never predict what happens. And and that's. You know, so in a way, you get too much knowledge. Also, f sometimes for it to be sort of compressed into uh, nice articles with a strong thesis, but 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 still, uh, you do get uh, valuable knowledge. And uh, and then, of course, I, I I work within this participatory IT center, which is also sort of bridging towards computer science and and HCI design. And and uh, we do produce stuff. Uh, that's part of our our um, our um, method method of research. Like you know, like uh, and anthropologists also go to you know foreign countries or stay at home or whatever they do. So it's it's part of the research, you know, to produce stuff, put it out there, see what happens, and then write this up. Uh, but but obviously, yeah, it's a difficult. It it does have some challenges. But on the other hand, if you don't take any challenges, you know, it's what's in it then? <laughs> you know, you you just produce, you know, uh, you know, you just read the books and then produce new versions of them. You know, it's you have to sort of also take some chances, break down some walls, do something new, to 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 yeah, to to do something that's noteworthy, I guess. So, yeah. But I'm 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 pretty certain I'm not an artist. You know, it's it's not my artwork I'm presenting. It's a research platform. <laughs>